So, uh, welcome. We, uh, I'd like to now call the Law and Housing Authority Board of Commissioners a special meeting of Tuesday, May 31st, 2022, in, to order. We have a roll call. Judy Alperos. Commissioner. Chair Joe Peck. Commissioner Hidalgo Perry. Commissioner Tim Waters. Um, Harold Dominguez, uh, Interim Executive Director. Peter Daniels, Accounting Supervisor. Molly O'Donnell, Housing and Community Investment Director. So, Commissioner um, Aaron Rodriguez is not here due to personal, who is not here for this meeting due to personal uh, interest. And we are waiting on Commissioner. Uh, She's in the building somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she is in the building. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're doing the review and approval of the May 3rd, 2022 minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. I'll second. So it's been moved by uh, Council Commissioner Waters, seconded by Commissioner Donald Bay. All those in favor? Aye. We don't really Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, do we have any public invited to be heard? We have uh, three minutes to listen to public invited to be heard. I would love to address the council just for just a couple minutes. I know you would guys you, have. Would you mind giving us your name and address, please? My name is Lance Whitaker. I've resided at 1750 Collier Street. I've been there for approximately 10 years. I've lived in Monmouth for 40 years now, almost. And I'm here today because I've been talking with Doug at the city planning office and I would like to get permission from the city council to start a business here in Longmont in which membership of a membership only smoking club for the use of cannabis. Um, if any of you council members would like to talk to me further about what I would need to start such a business, um, please give me a call at 303-485-6048. Um, again, I live at 1750 Collier. If you have any questions now, I'd be more than free to answer them with my remaining minutes. Thank you for coming. This is the Loma Housing Authority, but your uh, where you really need to go is to our next Tuesday's uh, council meeting at 7 p.m. Okay. or contact uh, the city about your wanting to start the business. I will be there at okay. the next city council meeting, but it, like I said, if you, anybody in the city council would like to get a hold of me earlier, you know, to brain pick my head or you know, and okay. get ahead of the storm, so to speak. I would like to keep this on the down low in the city. I know you guys only allow four dispensaries in town, so I figure you guys would allow even fewer smoker clubs, so I'd like to get in on the ground floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to our interim executive director for all of the business. Oh, I forgot. Any questions? No. We can't no. ask you. No. Thank, Thank you. Take it away, Kendra. Take it away. All right. <laughs> um, so we got our audit, and this is kind of my first time presenting this, so let me know if less is more or if you want you know, more um, details. Um, basically, I'm going to run through what the changes that happened for this year on the balance sheet and income statement to kind of show you where monies came from, what changes happened. So on the balance sheet, our current assets, they increased, and those were basically due to developer fees. Developer fees that came in from the Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments, as well as the suites for cash flow surplus, which increased our assets. And reading, reading the thing. Uh, I, I could tell that it, well, a lot of stuff was from developer fees. But I have no idea what causes a developer to pay us a fee. 
So it's kind of all wrapped up in the actual development itself. There is both deferred developer fees and there's also cash developer fees. So it's basically as the construction starts to build, they send equity payments that provide developer fees to the Longmont Housing Authority or the Longmont Housing Development Corporation, depending on who the owner is. And then there's also deferred developer fees. So that is, it's kind of like, if we don't keep developing and getting the developer fees, we won't have enough money or revenue to fund the LHA. So that's kind of why as development halted, we weren't getting developer fees in. And, so, and you may be able to talk a little more about it too, since you're involved in the construction process. Sure, so when you do a, a low income housing tax credit project, you get equity investors that invest equity in the project in exchange for the tax credits long term. Um, and as you meet certain milestones in, in uh, the construction and getting to like lease up point, where you can actually get cash flow at that point, um, portions of that come in, for, in as fees, which is set out at the, at the start in your pro forma and your, your development agreements. Um, so you get fees at that point at a negotiated rate, and then you get a uh, deferred developer fee over time as well at a negotiated rate. So they're paying you for the benefit of the light. See, what I'm trying to figure out is what the consideration is, which was not mentioned by either of you. Yes, it is It is, it is. wrapped up with the, the equity that's brought in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. It's the equivalent of pay to play? Yep. Yeah. That's probably the best way to say it. <laughs> yeah, that is the way to say it. Um, Non-current assets, um, they increased about $5 million. That is mainly due to the $4.1 million carry back note that was carried forward to LHA with AMA's um, dissolution. So AMA dissolved this, this year, which LHDC was a part of. Um, when they did the transaction, they actually put the note on AMA, but we really needed to dissolve AMA. Mm -hmm. So at the very end of December, um, we got that transferred, and that caused an increase in our um, non-current assets for, for LHA. Non-capital assets, it's literally just the depreciation that we have. Um, we did write off a lot of depreciation um, as it was old. A lot of it was back from 2016 that we didn't even have. Um, but the majority of it was just the annual depreciation. Our current liabilities, they increased and it was a combination of things. Um, last year we had several things on our balance sheet such as our um, the PPP loan, uh, we got money in for that. Our CARES Act funding, which was money that came in from HCV, um, and an LHDC payment that was um, loaned to us for the build of AMSA. All of those were reductions on our balance sheet. And then our additions was our local rental assistance, um, which is a new program provided by the city of Longmont. They fund us and we fund local vouchers for them. Um, along with our um, Briarwood loan, which was moved from um, our long-term liabilities to our current because of the balloon payment that was due in April. You'll also see that as a subsequent event in the audit because we are in the process of refinancing that um, for an additional 15 years without the balloon payment to put us in a better position. Um, <clears throat> long-term liabilities basically decreased um, due to a reduction in pension liability and once again the Briarwood mortgage moving from long term to current. So I put these up here, um, which is basically the assets and liabilities um, of the whole organization. So you have the general fund, the housing choice vouchers, um, the housing choice um, vouchers CARES Act, which had to be reported separately. You have the Longmont Suites, which is basically the vacant land um, next to the suites. Um, Briarwood Apartments and Office, um, 615 Main Street, um, Moderate Rehab, which is basically the in-betweens vouchers. And then um, they have the RISE program. I need to have them switch that. That should be the LRA program. So we'll start recognizing revenue as we issue vouchers. What is LRA? Um, Longmont uh, local rental assistance. Okay. So the city of Longmont provided LHA with local rental assistance, and so we're working with an um, agency at the city of Longmont that's 
does kind of the eligibility for um, homeless individuals, um, and they go out looking for vouchers. Because you're on this, I promise an answer next time you're here for Commissioner Yarborough, restricted versus unrestricted cash. What's the difference? So restricted is, um, so I'll, I'll kind of use the housing authority as, so housing choice vouchers, that money is restricted specifically for housing assistance payments. Then you have unrestricted, which is, um, can be the housing choice voucher admin um, or anything else that doesn't have a particular, like you don't have to use it for a particular use. So if there's money coming in, so for example, if we have money coming in, and let's, that's, um, so here, in the general fund, it's all listed as un unrestricted, because nothing in our general fund says that we have to use this for a specific use. Um, same thing for here, you have restricted. So our housing choice vouchers are about $65,000, and our admin is actually in the negative right now. A lot of that is because we have to report um, the fluctuations that happen with our pension plan. Um, and so that causes us to go into a negative because we still have to report it even though we haven't really paid out on the pension, but we still have to report all the liabilities that may be due to us later on down the road. So that's kind of the difference between unrestricted and restricted. If it's if it has to be used by a federal source for a specific purpose, like I can't take this money that's for um, the housing choice vouchers and use it for something else. For admin. Yeah. It's obligated. That's cash to the bank. It's obligated for purpose or encumbered for a specific pay X. purpose. Yeah. So, um, and then this is the liability sheet. So I don't know if you guys have any questions on the, on the balance sheet. No? So revenues and expenses, um, uh, once again, um, we increased due to developer fees earned for AMSA, and a lot of that, that was earned was specifically for um, the deferred developer fees, because a lot of the cash came in, um, as well as the AMSA carryback is a big one on every little piece of information. So operating expenses, we didn't really increase a whole lot, but the biggest increase that we saw, which actually is kind of a good, is that we had a higher increase in expenditures for our housing assistance payments. That means we were paying more vouchers out in 2021 than we were. Um, it was about $305,000 difference from the prior year. Um, and then our non-operating revenue also again, AMSA carry back loan interest, the PP loan recognition, and the gain of sale on LHA's van that was sold. Um, and then just talk more about that. I didn't realize we had a van. We did, we had a van. Two mm -hmm. so it was <laughs> it was not in great shape. It was a it was a utility, it was a utility a van for parts, and when we did for the for maintenance purposes, and not transport. And just so you know, when we took it to our fleet department to review it for safety, yeah, uh, then we needed to sell it. So, um, yeah, exactly. And so we're in the process of um, re uh, evaluating how we work with our broader maintenance group. You know. I guess because there, we've had issues around transporting, transporting residents, yeah. so I just want to make sure we, we were missing an opportunity oh, because right. we owned a van. No, no. Okay. I don't think we realized we owned the van for like a few months after we took it over, to be honest. No. We were, it's just part of the learning curve because nobody used it. Are you looking at buying for so I won't go into all the notes. There's so many notes, um, and they just go on and on forever. But our last thing that I wanted to present to you today was we have no single audit findings. This kind of shows you where we were at in 2017. We had so this this represents the financial statement findings, and then the dark orange is like single audit findings, programmatic, you know, eligibility, that type of stuff. 
So in 2017, we had one. Um, in 2018, it went to seven. So we had three financial statement findings and four um, regular single audit. Same thing in 2019. In 2020, we were able to drop all of our single audit findings. The HCB staff did a really great job of getting all the files cleaned up. I mean, they, they audited probably 60 to 65 files um, in 2020, and we did the same thing in 2021. Um, and then we got rid of our final financial statement findings, which was the separation of duties, the financial statements, being able to prepare our financial statements. Um, I can't remember the third one was. It may have been adjusting journal entries. Um, Good. Could you tell us what a single audit finding is? Yeah, so a single audit is if you receive $750,000 or more in federal funding, you have to go through a single audit. It's required by the feds. So what they do is they, they take audit that particular account. transaction. They account. audit that program. Okay. program. So so they take your total dollars on your SEPA and they say, um, here's a percentage. So let's say 10%, and then they have to pick 10% of the programs within that SEPA and audit those. Since we only have HCV, that's the that thing that will always get audited. Um, but they will do, um, and then so the feds also tell us they'll tell. The auditors that says this is what we want audited. So they audited HQS inspections. They'll audit, you know, eligibility. Was this person actually eligible for the voucher? And so they'll go through the whole file review to do those specific testing um, and ask questions. And so if and that's usually where it was. It was usually eligibility. It was um, HQS inspections. It was CMAP reporting. You know, all those types of stuff that we were seeing findings on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And where it touches on what she said, so I think you heard me say last time when we turned in the last HCB report to HUD, they had no fatals, mm -hmm. which means there's problems with your qualifications. Um, well, it's not here, it is here, because they're all connected with each other when they fold, and so when we get no fatals in the submittal in terms of the HCB voucher piece, that's pretty significant. I think that's the first time they've done that in a while. Not, it, it happens. Most places, I think, I may look at the council member or Commissioner Yarborough, I think most places shoot for like 95%. Oh, yeah. So to have 100 is. Yes. So I'll open it up to questions if you have any questions for me. It was very impressive to read. It felt like you guys pulled a rabbit out of a hat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it did because there were these big favorable gains. Mm -hmm. And even without understanding half the entities that had acronyms, it still was obvious. So I'm really impressed. Yeah, no, it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. No, it was a lot of hard work. And um, yeah, even without the PPP. I mean, guys, amazing. Awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, do you need a motion to accept this? We, we don't specifically need a motion, no. It's more of a, a summary. What I would say is um, I don't think any of us can. I just don't know how. I mean, to be honest with you, every time I was talking to them, they were working on just the hours and hours that they put in and tracking down and getting AR and AP and everything sorted out and reconciling Yardy and shifting to Yardy so that, that we could fully utilize the program and it was just amazing and, and, and now you know when we're working through budget it's like okay Kendra if we could do this this and this how and she can just answer it and so the controls that we have now both from an audit perspective and then from an operational budget perspective and what we can move are pretty impressive. Now, unfortunately to many residents, we say no a lot, but it's because we're seeing the numbers as they're coming in. Now that we're here, it's really now, how do we expand the revenue component so we can say yes more and do more programs? And we had a baseline, and I think we're in a good spot now. You just answered my question. Well, does this allow you more freedom to weigh in? forward, you know, because you, you're in a good place. That's where the development's key. 
And so when you see Christman II and why Christman II is so important, and then why we said, well, we're going to push Village Place resyndication off to the end yeah. of 2022, right? Or is it? 2023. 2023. Well, we're going to push Village Place off, but we're going to bring the um, property on Hoover up in terms of like, you know, that's what a lot of these folks are going to be working on. It is about getting those developer fees now into the system so that you can have that consistent source of revenue coming in so we can do more. But you can't get off cycle on developer development. To give you a little bit of an idea, is our expenditures for this year are $847,000. A lot of that is management, it's accounting, it's our IT, it's our regional property manager. All of that can't be paid for at the property level. It has to be paid at the LHA level. So when you bring in the management fees, and you bring in, um, even LHDC pays a corporate management fee. So if LHDC goes away, we won't have that corporate management fee. We only get about $485,000 from that. And if we have expenditures of $847,000, then we need that three hundred and sixty-one dollars to be made up by developer fees that are coming in to the LHA or other revenue sources that we have to figure out um, in the future. This is the, I know you explained it simply, so that I can understand. But um, I see this very same mindset and strategy and paradigm that just goes into our capable housing and everything, that it's the same exact, we don't have the funding revenue from the CBDGA for uh, other grants, but it's getting those fees to offset what, yeah, what the city can't provide. So. Yeah, and I think that's why we've learned, I mean, probably for the first time in the history of the city, we are now developers in that we have developed commercial property with affordable property in it, so we're in the middle of trying to figure that out. We've now developed Christman. We're now getting ready to develop the Hover Street. We're on, the, we're on that side of building properties, and so it's understanding the fee structures, the security structures. And honestly, that's probably what led us learn through many of the points that you saw previously as yes. a council, is we were running into those barriers ourselves. Right. And it was like the 150000 that we had to figure out on securities at the last minute, or the deal was dead. Right. Now sales taxes, we're just learning this. We're learning it, and so we're bringing different tools because we're actually fighting through them at the same time that other developers are in other projects. Right. Question? Um, you said we say no a lot. Um, was I to understand that was we say no to residents more because we don't have any funds? Or Correct. Is that what yeah. that meant? But there are a lot I, of requests that we can't fund. Okay, mm -hmm. but um, I'm getting fewer complaints than I ever did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know they're not my word, but I got them anyway. So. <laughs> We're still fighting through a lot of issues. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, we said, I, I talked to one of my coffees and conversations I do with Lisa, you know, um, we have supportive services at the suites and we have a component at the lodge in Hearthstone. Ideally, over time, we want every one of our facilities to have some component of supportive services. We're just not at the point where we can do that. Um, we're trying to build small budgets for what do you call them, Lisa? Of like activity. activity funds, and so like they want to do things, and sometimes it's what we would like this furniture, and it's just like, Ick. we're pretty. And every property is different, so their margins are different on every property. So just curious, would the uh, mental health dollars that we set aside help with getting? Uh, uh, care at each LHJ facility. Uh, it won't be a total wraparound, but hopefully a mental health person or an addiction person like Freedom Cafe, or will that, those dollars help with that? It could, and what we're trying to do, taking my LHJ hat off, putting the city hat on. Okay. Um, and before I say that, Michelle back here in the corner, what we haven't talked about is how she's augmented budgets by utilizing 
funds available for older adults and bringing grants in and all sorts of things. And so we augment with other pieces too. Okay. Um, I don't know how many grants you've applied for. Everything from attendance to computers to what else, Michelle? Fire stops. Fire stops. Rent. Rent. <laughs> um, I mean, she's she's augmented too. But but back to answer where we're coming from is yes. I mean, that's what we're trying to. Because that was the hope is that you would be able to use those funds to help. I would, yes. I would just add that we just concluded some input from the residents on the various amenities that Harold was just talking about and we had three advisory board members who were doing those conversations and so by the end of the week we'll have those all pulled together but we asked residents to do some priority prioritizing on those requests that they're putting in we want new grills or we want this or we want that and We've been met with Kendra to try and understand what are the dollar amounts available at which properties for resident services, and some properties do not have dollars yet mm -hmm. uh, and may not. So we're, we're trying to do that property by property to get an idea so all the residents have an opportunity to weigh in on what's important to them. Great. Um, so I'm glad you hear that. Um, if there's a, there's a, there is a whole history there, I think. I mean, there were LHA residents who thought they were getting into to one kind of an environment, mm -hmm. only to discover over time, as marginal dollars decreased, the kind of programming that occurred just didn't happen, and people are still resentful. I think in some cases. Exactly. Um, one of the one of the uh, kind of spirals that LHA got into when when development for the most part stopped, like we had nothing going on, then Fall River came on was the fact that LHA was surviving on developer fees. Mm -hmm. right. So they pulled, LHA pulled management of the properties away from, what was the firm, who remembers, that we were contracting to manage our property. So we became property managers, right? Partnering with LHA, LHDC to develop. Um, and we had people managing properties, in many cases, who were ill-equipped to do the management, right? That became the source of, you know, serious complaints from from residents. So now we're on an upswing, right? We've got we've got Kristen going, we've got six projects we've lined up. At some point that's gonna play out though, where we're where we're gonna we're gonna tap out on development. Or we're gonna max out on development. And we're gonna in an LHA, none of us will be around at the time, by the time those projects are in, is gonna be in a similar situation where the de developer fees are not going to be rolling in. Right? Um, at some point along the way, there needs to be a strategy developed for what are the possible revenue sources in addition to the kind of things Michelle's going to mention to offset what would be the loss of those development development or developer fees when, when LHA is not doing the kind of a development we are now on the, the front end of doing. Part of that is the management fees that we're building in. So you all approved a lot of agreements on Christmas 1 and 2. They put one about Three four hundred thousand in Christmas one. Uh, I think so. That's what we put in Christmas one. We put in one point eight million in Christmas two, so we're at two point one million total for those projects. Embedded in the agreement was a negotiation that in four years we take over management of Christmas one and Christmas two, which then builds an ongoing revenue stream to help deal with what you're you're talking about now. So every time we do this, we have to figure out how we get more management of these facilities yeah. so that when the time comes where you don't have development occurring, that that's in play. The other side of that development component, though, I would say also comes into, there's also redevelopment opportunities and things like that. Resyndication. Resyndication that we can do to bring into this. Um, that actually was my question. Was, was, we're going to end up, if, if we we're in perfect equilibrium, where people died out of our senior housing at the same rate they came in, 
you would still have to recyclate those buildings and upgrade right. them and stuff. And those and things those yield develop for correct. phase two because they also have that. That's correct. Yes. So the, the ARPA funding funded projects that we're bringing in are that's going to be a big boost. It's going to be a big boost. Make that for some lost time and be a big boost. However, um, just like LHA did for years before, before this gap period, they did, would have a periodic schedule of doing development because they they can access city private activity bond funds and some other affordable housing funds to help do that. So that would be the idea where we had this big boom because of ARPA. You know that's what we're supposed to do is take advantage of that um, to do great work in big fashion and then regulate it, <laughs> regulate it going forward. So there will always be development happening. It's just probably the pace after ARPA's through will be more. And Molly, we are doing other sort of inclusionary housing. We're taking on contracts for. Oh, right. We do, we do have another creative revenue source, and that's that. Um, so for inclusionary housing, a developer is offering their, their affordable units on site, but they don't have the expertise to do property management. They have contracted with LHA because we could do income verifications all day long, or way quicker than they could. So they're paying a fee to the LHA to process their income verifications and recertifications uh, so that they can provide those units on site without needing to specialize. Right. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a fiber optic something. So he's oh. getting hold of ETS. Okay. Oh. Not, not somebody. Okay. 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 So, is there any other audit questions? Oh, there. No. Yeah. yeah. Very well done. Yeah. You have to take a breath. Next year. No, you move forward. Time to yeah. Exactly. Well, we have to start budget. budgets, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the budget. Our heart's still in the law. Yeah. So I'm not like, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just going to ask that you fully say We are. Um, I think we'll have to, you know, it's going to be one thing once we start adding more properties, we're going to need more staff. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because right now we're probably maxed. Um, our, our account is probably maxed. With all of the um, investor reports that we have to provide on a monthly basis, are you looking at more managers? Because in there's Spring Creek and one mm -hmm. manager between the other. I think they just hired Fall River. Fall River. Village. Well, they just hired a manager that's going to be at Fall River and Spring Creek, and then the one that was at Fall River and Spring Creek will be with the Village Place. Mm -hmm. right? So there's still going to be one manager for Fall River and Spring Creek. With an assistant. So Lisa's got the, and, and why is that? the detail. Because of the size of the properties are only 60 units, so the revenue cannot support a full-time manager. Okay. But between the two properties, they can support one full-time manager. And with all the LH, um, the light tech properties, we have two assistant managers that float and help out. Okay, because that, I can get a complaints. Yeah, we had a, we had a lull there when we had a couple vacancies, but there, we had our, Talk about our new person coming up. So we have, um, she's coming from Loveland Housing Authority. She works with actually uh, one of Wally's new hires as well. Um, great references, used to running three to 500 units at a time. So the two properties will be easy for her because she's had five properties under her at once. Mm -hmm. So she will um, transition and start hopefully later this week. Um, we're going to have her dive in head first to Fall River because mm -hmm. um, they're the least dependent on a um, manager but so she can get her feet wet start running the process there and cat will still maintain spring creek and then she will slowly ease into village place as rachel eases into spring creek so it will be a smooth transition so the residents don't feel that the manager just left them because i think they they have that from previous so it's going to be a slow transition over my plan is almost six to eight weeks between the two properties to get the new manager in and cat over to Village Place. It's also been in evaluating the workload. And does a property of 60 people really need one full-time manager, or is that a want? And I think Lisa has done a really great job of evaluating really what it takes mm -hmm. to manage a property of what size and use her property management resources 
effectively. And for some residents, uh, that is a change that is, change is hard. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if they said this part of what I've asked them to do is figure out how we can rotate. Did you talk about that? No, not yet. No, I've also asked how can you rotate because I think it's important to, we see this in a lot of our operations where if somebody stays in something for so long, you can tend to degrade relationships and, and then it just becomes a challenge. And so I've asked them to look at how can we create some version of a rotate rotation so we can cross train and we can keep people engaged at a different level and sort of recharge their batteries. Um, and we're looking at that all over, whether it's the DRC, whether it's what we're doing in public safety. We know you can't keep people in the same roles. I agree. Because it'll wear mm -hmm. you out. Yeah. So, and this is a little off topic from the audit, I'm assuming we're different, <laughs> is that um, who, since, since we are now fully staffed, or close to it, closer it's to close, it. Close to <laughs> right. Who do we contact if a resident contacts us? I have, I'm struggling with that. Both of you. And Lisa. Okay. So Lisa, myself, and Molly. Okay. I normally would have said Michelle, but Michelle's close. Mm -hmm. way out. Um, <laughs> something that we're all really jealous of. Right yes. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so it doesn't matter which which put property all, at all. No, put it's, all three of us on there, okay. and at that point, we can all circle in pretty fast. But depending on the nature of it, um, what we're trying to do is push decision decision making at the appropriate level. Okay. And so sometimes we, you know, we'll push to the manager, or I'll push to, to Lisa. Depending on the nature of the issue, then it'll escalate to Molly or me. Sometimes we bring Sarah Arnie in, depending mm -hmm. on the nature of what we're dealing with. Um, and really, some of these complaints, I think you probably already know about. Them. They get frustrated and say, well, I'm going to contact the council or the mayor. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't want to do this because the chances history. are you've dealt with this today. Mm -hmm. would, so, would, would you, I would appreciate it, an email from somebody with the names and the email addresses and the phone numbers uh, in, right. in the kind of the order okay. that you would like us to refer to, right? Okay. Whether it's you or on this case, maybe it's on these issues of Terrell, on these issues of Lisa, something like that. that would be great. I oh, can yeah, drop it into like my NHA yeah. folder and just pull it up and get the yes. program, so I'm not searching for that. Exactly. Thank you. That's a great point. Because I have been struggling with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I handle this in really a trouble. <laughs> well, it's, it's for right now, I'm, I'm always saying just at least copy me on it because always. we're always learning right, right now. And, um, that sounds great. Okay, we're done with the, uh, with the audit. I'm going to move on to get into the uh, advisory board election. So, <laughs> so, this one turned into a bit of a fiasco this year. Okay. Um, and part of it was because of the transition that we made with you all in terms of being the actual LHJ board. And so what happened in this was that the clerk's office approached this as they would for normal council advisory boards. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not that. You are the housing authority board, which is different in terms of who can be on the board and who can't be on the board. So for example, um, you may, we have Lauren Seeley who's working with the county in terms of affordable housing. Lauren moved, advised this, this is when Karen was still here. Karen reached out to Eugene, we were like, oh, this is an issue with the charter. The charter doesn't apply because you're not the council, you're the housing authority board. So when we went through this and how positions were advertised and what we went through, we realized we need to separate this process from the city process because you all aren't the city council. You are the housing authority board. And so... And they advise us. Not and they advise you as your housing authority role, not as city council members. So we called a quick timeout and we're going to, I'm channeling my inner Eugene. Um, and he didn't smile, but I channel in my inner Eugene where you have to bring the separation that you need into this. And so we're going, one of the things we wanted to talk to you all about is 
restarting the process, but starting it as the Housing Authority Board. Um, we had this conversation with the advisory board, and they indicated that there were some things that they wanted to look at in terms of specifics that they think they need on the board. So um, Cameron Grant is no longer on the board. They really felt they need some kind of legal, somebody with a, you know, an attorney background on the board. They also talked about uh, somebody with development experience that can help move through the conversations. What else did they? Finance. Finance experience. And that's a little bit different. So we have um, Tom, the B, who, Tom's an accountant at CU. So this is more the internal auditing of that financial piece. What they were really saying is somebody with a financial background in terms of building the capital stacks on the development side. And, and so they wanted us to talk to you all about that to see, do you want to be fo more focused on what you're looking for in the board to fill some of these roles, or do you just want us to open it up again as the housing authority for it? And we can bring this back. Well, it seems like well, that um, having you know on the board over the last few years, we've had a baker, mm -hmm. we've had a developer, we've had an attorney, all of which were helpful in building capital stacks or the relationship with council or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, when when that was the executive board, um, I don't know that the city needs somebody on that board with the expertise on on, on financing or how to build a capital stack. You probably got that down pretty well. Or, or to be providing legal advice. It seems to me that more than anything, we would need a board that would advise us on the kinds of things we ought to be doing in the interest of, of uh, resident quality, the quality of life for residents. Right? That's one of our goals. I think we ought to go back to that list of goals you gave to us mm -hmm. and say, you know what? That's at the top of the list. We, we need a board that's going to advise us on what we ought to be thinking about in terms of policy and resource allocation to help accomplish that goal. Which of the other goals would the advisory board be most aligned with? Because I don't, I just think it's shifted or changed in terms of what they need versus what we already have with the relationship with the city. Person, okay. no, that's fine. And then what we may have to look at is what do we bring to the advisory board? What do we bring straight to the board? And development's a good example. Is do we bring that to the advisory board, or is that something that we bring straight to you all? Um, depending on the mix of food's where. Well, it, it may be something you take to them, but the questions you ask, or what you're asking advice on, would be different for a product based on you know, the composition of the board and what we'd like to move from. But that's, I'm just, that's my opinion. So we did just process the bylaws update to make sure that the resident quality of life was central. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone on this advisory board, whether they're a resident, a citizen that's not a resident, or a professional in that industry, they've all committed to that. Um, I think specifically, do we want, or do, do you want, a, a mix of expertise or primarily resident based? That's one thing we were wondering about because the applications that we do have are, are more in one area than the other. So, uh, Commissioner Martin, it seems to be that in line with what we've done with the city boards, that the advisory board should get to choose, right? They're, they're going to be passing people on uh, to us based on the idea of, of how they meet the board's needs. So if we've, com if, if we've clearly defined what the advisory board's charter is, then why not leave it up to them as to what they need? And I think they wanted to ask you, I mean, that's the question, right? So we're going in this new process where the advisory boards are looking, and I think that was kind of the genesis of that conversation, that conversation yeah. is what is it that you would want to see? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, similar to what I said before, sideboards, mm -hmm. they were concerned about bringing recommendations that may have been different than what you all were expecting. So to me, this is the flip of basically what we're doing on our board interviews as council people. We're asking those those advisory boards to tell us what they think they need on those boards. And we are now telling the advisory board what we would 
like him to bring to us. But as far as what's on the advisory board, when you bring your development review, et cetera, to them, I would like somebody on that board to, to have enough expertise to question you so that there's a different train of thought as to what you bring back to us. Does that make sense? Or Because if it's totally resident-based, we won't get any advice on anything else. And, and it's very different than it was before, just, just based upon this audit, that even though it was heavily makers, uh, financial people, legal, et cetera, on the advisory board, as, as uh, Commissioner Waters said, we're not there anymore. You, you probably know the capital stack and the revenue better than the other commissioners did, but what is it we need from the advisory board? And I just, I don't, Think it should be totally resident based? I wasn't suggesting totally. Okay. But that's just one of since that's the top of our list of goals. It should be. Well, should look be at the goals and the, you know, those kind of guide, I think. Quality of life for the residents should be great, but they should also. But they can have that expertise and be looking at it through that lens. Some people, some of the board members they should. should. Help, but it should, it should be should. definitely <laughs> quality of life for residents. And what are you? What you're doing, what you bring to them, is that quality of life base. That's what I think they should be looking at when you bring it to them. But then they're going to advise us. Is that right? Do I have this right? So right, we, 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 <laughs> right. So what we do is we bring everything that we're bringing to you just ahead to the board, and then they make recommendations, and then we bring it to you with the recommendations. Okay. And they really should have that expertise. Oh, uh, yeah. At least some. Not total. Yeah. They have proposed increasing to seven members instead of five to try and expand the base. Okay. Yeah, get more mm -hmm. kinds of expertise. But they're going to have to deal with who applies. That's, yeah, that was going to be nice. Right. <laughs> right. So, and the thing is, it seems like they should say, they, they can identify not just our residents are unhappy about such and such a thing, but we don't think there are enough resources to meet these residential needs. And then it would be up to us to decide what's needed, right? Um, and then you can go with the tax credits with the staff. They don't need to say you need tax credits. They right. they need to say you need another building. Or, or decide whether or not you should have more caseworkers or go for caseworkers in the in the or programs. What kind of programs do you have to be able to come and work? And then uh, question you on that and then advise you to bring it to us. Does that make sense? So what I'm hearing is adequate representation from people who live in the facility so we don't lose sight of mm -hmm. the the resident experience yes. and our units, but with some expertise that can balance out the group. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think they have that too, in the seven. Yeah, I think, they, if we I, get, I think they all have I think that. if we can enlarge it a little bit, I think we can balance it. Are you pleased with the board then? Yeah, they, I mean... This group has fought through a lot. Are they more now? Um, I think some are, I think some aren't. I think, you know, the core wants to continue. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I know Lauren really wants to continue it. Um, and, and she's bringing a different set. She's now doing kind of this work with the county, which mm -hmm. actually brings some interesting partnership components that we can have. Absolutely. Um, they're committed. I mean, and they're volunteering, and they're out there doing, you know, the the work with the residents, and and so. I think what I would say is you don't want to go too far on the side of having experts because you lose the residents, exactly. which is exactly. I think where we came from. Mm -hmm. You also don't want to lose the other side where you lose sight of some of the development components. So. And you want it to be meaningful as an right. advisory board. So, that's. That's the important part of crafting that agenda. So that they do get to advise, which you may or may not accept. Um, so that's a dance. So then most likely we would be bringing bylaw updates to the next meeting, July 6th, to get the seven. 
and then address the election again. Okay. Do you need a any voted here? If you are given the direction of increasing the size of the board and then mm -hmm. the specifics about resident component and technical, we'll bring that on this in July. Okay. Okay, one more thing. Okay, go ahead. Pass that. If, if we had our goals lined up and we asked the question, what are the kinds of what kind of expertise would we want in the advisory board to help advance our thinking, uh, our planning, resource allocation to accomplish those goals? What would be on that board that's not there? Um, somebody in terms of ex expertise. Somebody with social service experience that I think could advise us on that. Um, I think there would be some development components just to. I just think that ought to be the, uh, the, what we've been taught to as goals ought to drive the, kind of the range of expertise or experiences that would be most helpful to us, mm -hmm. right? In terms of an advisory role advising mm -hmm. us on what. So we need those goals. I can align. I can align. To re, redo the goals. We can align the membership with the goals. That's if that's easier for you all that we can do that, and know that residential component is going to be important too. <coughs> yeah, I just. I mean, I, Cameron was was awesome on the board, but right. we did. We don't need a an legal opinion. That, that we don't need dueling legal opinions as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, on the development side, as I mentioned to you, though, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm interested in, in the possibility of building more units for families or for single people who, <coughs> excuse me, aren't qualified to live in, in, in assisted living type, I'm sorry, not assisted living, but older adult. If that's possible, I know that, I know that, speaking for myself, the elderly community is exploding and we do need that housing. But we also have a lot of people um, who need that lower income housing as well, just to be able to live here. That is Christman. Christman is not age restricted. That's my cut. Uh, but as long as we constantly have somebody on the board who understands that and keeps right. us balanced, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm looking for is a okay. balance. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think Why did you look at me when you talk about exploding? I did. I look at myself. I explode every night when I look in the mirror. Oh my gosh! My hey, I can. I think I can join AARP and. I'll be quiet. Is it what five months, Michelle? Oh. No. And we're going to oh, celebrate that. No. Celebrate that. That's not I fifty. Am. You're still a kid. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking for the discount for hotel rooms. <laughs> yeah. All right, no, I think we're good, and I think we can bring something back. But... I know, that's why I was um, But okay, we can take your, your feedback and bring something back. Great. So, do we have any other commissioner comments? You're all good? So, uh, let's have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thanks for your time today yes. and what you gave us here in the policy guidance because we're now, that you saw the team fully built, we're now going to start moving incredibly fast and some of these things that you saw earlier, we may just break that. Okay.